start. Well, last week we were uh, finishing up um, or trying to finish up uh, this certain portion before we get into some really good stuff. <clears throat> we were talking, uh, we had finished discussing uh, Ishmael's mom, Hagar, and how the Lord had really responded to her. <clears throat> And we found out why he responded to her, and the scriptures are very clear, because of the oppression that she received from Sarah. <clears throat> Excusez-moi. And so there were, there were these so many things, and we discussed it at length last week, <clears throat> that he had done for Hagar. But then, <clears throat> you know, we, we would look at history and we go, well, yeah, but Ishmael is, you know, the... The Arabs, and they've been nothing but a problem to Abraham's seed or a problem, you know, in the world, as it were. And so we moved on to, um, we're in Genesis 16, and we moved on to verse 12 to show that God's dealing um, with Ishmael is not in ignorance. It's not like he doesn't understand that Hagar was, his mom was oppressed by Sarah, the wife of Abraham. Abram, as he's called at this point. Um, but Ishmael, <clears throat> he, he hadn't even been born, but, he, but God knew what he would be. Um, and um, so verse 12 begins to describe that spirit to us. This is uh, Genesis 16 and verse 12. And he will be a wild man, and his hand will be against every man, and every man's hand against him. And he shall dwell in the presence of of all of his brethren, and <clears throat> we explained a lot of that, but the main part that we got into was that um, Ishmael, even though Hagar had been blessed and taken care of and given a seed and God named Ishmael, <clears throat> that didn't change Ishmael's way or way that he would be the rest of his life. And, um, and we said that that was one of the proofs that Ishmael was not the firstborn. Okay, and so, you know, again, um, when, when you uh, look back at some of our studies on the firstborn, we, you, we can go all the way back to the prodigal son. Well, the prodigal son ended up being the firstborn, but he was not the firstborn by birth order. <clears throat> uh, the elder son was, but he was leapfrogged over because he, you remember the spirit of the elder son. And so um, um, we looked at that in relationship to Cain and Abel. And Cain was the firstborn by birth order, but he got put back and Abel became the firstborn. And, um, and we're going to see that same thing happen here because uh, Ishmael is going to be born and um, Isaac will be the next born, but Isaac will be the firstborn. In every one of those cases, it had to do with your attitude, with your how you treated people, um, that sort of thing. That's the, that was the marker. That was the thing by which God was able to see <clears throat> this is actually the firstborn and this over here, even though it was in first uh, uh, birth order, the firstborn is not the spirit of what the firstborn was all about. And if you hearken back to the book of Exodus, then you remember that, that there were firstborn and then there was just Israel, the nation that was delivered and the firstborn were set aside for sacrifice to God. <clears throat> so that's where we are now, uh, looking at Ishmael. And in that, de uh, that description in verse 12, we get an idea that uh, his hand's going to be against everyone. He's going to, you know, there's all this stuff that is the exact opposite of Jesus laying down his life. <clears throat> and um, so we went through a portion of this, and I think, well, <clears throat> if we covered this paragraph, I like reading at least the last paragraph so that we can sort of catch up. 
So this is what I wrote and might have read last week <clears throat> when we ended. Ishmael, though Abram's son, is not the firstborn, but why specifically? We will give other reasons later, but one reason is that his hand will be against every man. In other words, though he only exists because he was delivered from oppression by God's hand through Hagar's cry, um, yet he will grow up to become an oppressor. In other words, God, delivered, God even allowed him to be brought into existence because Hagar was oppressed of Sarah. So you would think that he would grow up to not be an oppressor, and yet that's exactly what he becomes. Okay? In other words, the very reason by which God delivered him was because he and Hagar were oppressed by Sarah. But he will become one who oppresses. This means that a person can be delivered from bondage, saved, uh, as Israel was from Egypt, yet live their Christian life as an oppressor. It means that they never really sought to conform to the firstborn. Remember, the goal is conformity, but not to Jesus of Nazareth, but the firstborn who does not oppress but lays down his life. So, quoting Romans 8, 29, For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren, or that he might be the firstborn within many brethren. That that would be, if you're considered a firstborn, uh, and we had to explain this a long time ago, but <clears throat> at no point really are you the firstborn. But in the Old Testament, it's giving stories and pictures and whatever. So those who were with the Lord and conformed to that uh, in, this, in the spirit of what uh, Romans 8.29 is saying, um, they would be conformed to the image of his son so that he might be the firstborn among and within many brethren. And then God can say, that's my firstborn. This is my son in whom I'm well pleased. You see? And um, we, we discussed that a long time ago. But anyway, <clears throat> Jesus demonstrated this to his own disciples. Do you remember what he said in Luke chapter 9? So if you want to turn there, Luke chapter 9 and verse 52, <clears throat> we shall see what Jesus said. It is good to hear from the boss. <laughs> <clears throat> Luke 9, starting with verse 52 through 56. And sent messengers before his face, and they went, and entered into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. And they did, the Samaritans did not receive him because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. Okay, so they're going, well, if you're not going to be here with us, you know, and, uh, <clears throat> you know, we can even spiritualize that and say, well, he's not going to be with us. He's going to go to someplace else, you know. Um, <clears throat> the Lord needs to go where he needs to go, <laughs> you know, whether in us or whatever. He needs to go where he's, he needs to go. And verse 54, and when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them, even as Elijah did? Okay, so they're being scriptural. Uh, being scriptural is not the goal. The life of the scripture, which is Christ, the living word is the goal that we be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among us. And um, so they're pulling out scripture. You know, there's someone else who did that too. Who was it? Uh, Satan. <laughs> Quoting the scripture to Jesus. You know, like Jesus is going to go, oh no, I need to be scriptural. You <laughs> know? Now, I'm not, I'm not talking about intentionally violating the scriptures or anything like that. I am saying 
that the scriptures declare him and he's the fulfillment of that so that he can become the living word. <clears throat> and um, Jesus also, uh, as we're doing right now in the book of Genesis, um, Jesus always divides out who the firstborn is based on their attitude, based on the way that they treat others. So here Jesus is, the same one who, you know, raised up all those people in the Old Testament. Here he is looking at this situation and going, that is, that idea is nothing like me. See, well, Elijah did it. Well, you know, there might have been more to that story than we know, but I know one thing, that's not his spirit. How do I know that? Well, because you know the depths of the lamb nature. No, because he said right here, that's not a good idea. You know what I mean? We can just, we don't have to go off into deep fantasy land. We can just read it and say, that must be his heart, you know. All right, so um, uh, that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them, even as Elijah did. But he turned and rebuked them and said, ye know not what manner of spirit you are of. You don't know what spirit you're of. Okay. Could that be the case in the Christian church today? You know. That many don't know what spirit they are. What spirit are we of? He's not talking about the Holy Spirit right here. He's talking about the spirit of the family, the spirit of the lamb, the spirit of, of, of selfless giving, that, that nature. And he's saying, you know, let's see, what have you learned from me? Well, we've learned that we should go out by twos when we minister. And that's important. We know that. And we tell, when new people come in, we tell them that. We've learned, you know, and you can go down all this stuff that they had learned, but they hadn't learned him yet. They hadn't learned what the core issue is to Jesus. And, you know, besides, just because the Samaritans did, got upset because they weren't going to uh, receive him is no reason to just rain fire from heaven and burn them up, Okay. I'm thinking now. I'm just figuring now. So they don't, they don't really know what this is about yet. With all that they know, with all of the real flesh and blood Jesus that they could, and they could ask questions and they could say, well, okay. You know, there's so many times in the scriptures when it says, and they understood not what he said. Y'all remember that? A lot of times in the scriptures and the, the disciples go, and they understood not what he said. <clears throat> it never says, so they pulled him aside and said, Lord, you know. I mean, Jesus did that once with the parables, remember that. But most of the time, you don't hear them pulling him aside and going, you know what? I'm just an idiot. I don't know anything. I want to know what you mean and where, you know, out of the abundance of your heart. So I want to know your heart, not just what you speak, which is the scripture, but your heart. Um, <clears throat> And so we don't get a lot of that. Now, we also know that they wouldn't know that. And many of those, some of those verses that say that they understood not, it also has a little parenthetic phrase behind it or, or statement that says, um, but they realize what it meant after the resurrection. Right? You remember that? So, and that's the Holy Spirit coming and, and sharing with them. <clears throat> All right, so, uh, verse 55 again, and he turned and rebuked them and said, you know not what manner of spirit you are of. What, I, see, he didn't even just say you don't know what spirit you're of. He said you don't know what manner of spirit. Does that make a difference? Did that one little word in their manner make a difference? Yeah, it does, because he's talking about the way of that spirit, the way of his spirit, the way that he wants them. And it's certainly not, you know, well, we've got power. So, you know, anybody that doesn't believe the way we believe, 
you know, there's different ways of raining down fire, folks. You can, someone can, you know, be talking to somebody and they go, well, you know, I don't believe that, and da, 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 and they can just take whatever they know and just rain it on to them. Well, the scripture says this, and this is what it says, and for God's sake. This book is following me around. <laughs> Um, you see what I'm saying? Just raining down, you know, uh, and, and just trying to convince through power instead of, you know, being with the Lamb, being with the Lord, being with that Spirit, being with the manner of that Spirit. <clears throat> Verse 56, For the Son of Man has not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. Okay? So, you know, it, apparently it had a real impact on him. Well, it says, uh, but not to destroy their lives, but to save them, and they went to another village. It's like, did you get it? Are you just going to another village because, you know, we're moving on. I heard that. I heard somebody teach that at Bible school or church. Walk on and just go to another village and just... Keep moving, but never really let it stick. You know what I'm saying? You know, I mean, it would it would be interesting. Of course, I've given different versions of this, but the version I'm thinking of right now would be, <clears throat> it would be interesting if really the way the Lord saw us was like Velcro, and but only one side, and that His teaching was like the other side, and we had the sticky stuff, and the, but we would see how much really stuck. And then we would, he would just go, okay, I want you to see where everybody's really at. And somebody would have a lot of it on them, you know, and they're oh, it's sticking and getting it. Some, you know, it's hanging half off and, you know, not, not sticking at all. And they got more around their ankles than they got, you know, what they're wearing and stuff like that. <laughs> so, you know, that's, so there's, there's one of my weird thoughts. I drink to that. All right, so a similar one is, uh, um, I guess, parable that Jesus taught is similar to that, and that one's in Matthew um, chapter 18. So let's turn there, Matthew 18. <clears throat> Matthew 18 and verse, uh, starting with verse 23. And there's several verses here, so <clears throat> we, shall, we shall make our way. Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king, which would take account of his servants. Okay, so Jesus is constantly taking account of his servants. Okay, Jesus was doing that when the disciples were walking with him. They said this, and he said I'm taking account of you, and you're wrong. This, your manner uh, of life and the way that you proceed in this is totally the opposite of me. All right, so <clears throat> uh, take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him which owed him 10,000 talents. But for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold and his wife and his children and all that he had, and payment to be made. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him only a hundred pence. I added the word only because it's a big difference from the other guy. And he laid hands on him. Praise, praise God, he's going to pray for him. He's going to pray that he'll get the money and that it'll be fine and we'll all be blessed. Um, <clears throat> where was I? Um, what verse? 28. 28. But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence, and he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me that thou owest. Okay. So here he's raining fire on him. Do you see, do you see that? He's raining fire on him. Um, 
We would see something maybe similar, a uh, similar situation in our life, and and we would go, well, you know, um, I loaned you that, and you didn't do it. You didn't ever pay me back, you know, and uh, so you know, I'm going to be upset with you, and da 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 da, and all this kind of stuff. Um, he's trying to show us a certain spirit, okay. Um, and verse 29, and his fellow servant fell down into his feet and besought him, saying, have patience with me. Hmm, we heard that before. And I will pay thee all. And he would not. Okay. Now, this is, um, I'm trying to find it here. Uh, but the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants. This is happening apparently pretty quickly after the thing happened with him, with the king. When he fell down and said, you know, forgive me and I'll, I'll pay you all and da 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 and have mercy and all that kind of stuff. And um, um, verse 29 begins with, but the same servant went out and found one of his fellow. He went out and immediately found somebody that owed him way, way less. You know, okay, so here's, here's what he might be thinking. I don't know what he's thinking. Here's what he might be thinking. Well, the king's going to expect me to pay him back, and I told him I would pay him back, so I need to go gather up all the money I can get. Because the main thing is, with the king, is that we do this right, <clears throat> meaning the transaction. And that's not why the, the way the king thinks. It's a certain spirit that he's after. If you went out and you beat everybody to get enough money to pay off the king, the king is not going to be happy. Because with him, you know, it's not about, you know, the, everything being in a perfect order or, you know, all of the finances come in just the way that you expect or any of that stuff. It's not that. This, this story is telling us it's not that. It's the Spirit and the, and the Lord, let's see, takes account of his servants. Verse 23, the Lord takes account. And he does it. He, see, here's what we think. We think the Lord takes account of it at the very end when it's all done and everybody, everything's done, everything's wrapped up, and now it's judgment time. And he's sitting on a throne. He goes, here, give me the books. And he goes, okay, let's see. Uh, you know, this guy did da-da-da-da, and there was this, and then there was that. And, you know, he's taking account, and then carry the five. You know, he's looking at their lives and going, you know, he's figuring it all out right there on the throne and going, okay. Buddy, I got it right here now. I got it all figured up. No, I think he's taking account of us right now. Amen. All the time. The two examples that we just read are pictures of that. That's what he's doing. Right now, right now he's interested in our life. Right now he's interested in how we treat one another. Right now he wants to, he wants to see his firstborn son, the image of his son, and the firstborn in us. But, <clears throat> you know, a lot of people really do think it's going to be a judgment way at the end in the sense of what I'm talking about. And so, you know, he's, you know, he's uh, pretty much, you know, he's kind of okay now. You know, he's okay for a long time until we get in front of the judgment seat, you know. I mean, doesn't it kind of feel that way? Because most people seem to just be going, well, whatever. You know, it doesn't matter. And, and, uh, but if the Lord is taking account right now, it's like, you know not what spirit you are of. We ought to be able to hear that voice. Amen? Shouldn't we? We should. And, and so, you know, and I believe the Holy Spirit, you know, he's, he doesn't sleep a lot. You know, he's always on. Do you believe that? I know it. The guy is always on. You know how I know he doesn't sleep? Because he's always waking me up. (laughs) 
Am I going to have um, rose-colored lips after drinking this thing? <laughs> you wouldn't know anyway, would you? <clears throat> All right. So um, this guy's doing that. <clears throat> he's going and he's squeezing, you know, the turnip, trying to get blood out of a turnip. He's possibly, because it doesn't say that for sure, but why would he go out immediately and then find the first guy that owes him money and start pressing him, I need money, I need money. <clears throat> um, and then when he hears him say the exact same words that he said to the king, it doesn't occur to him. It doesn't occur to him, oh, Oh my God, that's what I said. Oh no, man, I don't need to be doing this. Does that make sense? It, you know, it's like, this is not, he doesn't hear that. He doesn't hear it at all, why? He's not just deaf, he's focused on the wrong thing. He's focused on what he can, you know, that he, he's, he's got a debt to pay and I gotta do this at whatever cost, particularly whatever cost to you, buddy. You're the first, you know. So, <clears throat> um, uh, verse uh, 30, okay, verse 32. Now let's do 31 again. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry and came and told unto their Lord all that was done. Okay, so... This isn't just a, a thing of tattletaling with these servants. It, it kind of reminds me of the guys who sat in the gate with uh, Mordecai. And they, you know, they were like, buddy, this ain't right, Mordecai. You know, your spirit is wrong. It's that kind of thing, I think. I think that they're going and they're saying, they're, they, they understand the king. They know what he wants. They know his heart. They know that he's not going, man, I need more money. I'm proud of you, son. Go beat up some more people. You know, let's feed the coffers, you know, something like that. No, not at all. They know him, and they go to him, and they say, look, you know, you remember the guy that you, you blessed and you covered? and You know, well, he just did this. The king's appalled. He's, he's not thinking, man, I, that guy's really on the job. You know, he's a great business guy. Soon as he gets out of here, he goes and he jumps on this, this need, this situation, to pay this off. Praise God. He doesn't do it. The Lord's angry. He's angry. Because he knows that what should have happened was not just a... I'm let you go free, or can I say it like this? I save you, but rather there should have been an impartation of the king's heart to him. Amen. There should have been an impartation of the king's heart. So that, and, and apparently the king felt like that too, or he wouldn't have been upset. He, you, you see what I mean? He wouldn't have been upset. But he was upset because this happened for you and I'm the king and you're the king of your life and you do it this way. But I'm supposed to be your king. I'm supposed to be the one that transfers and you become partaker of this kingdom and that you can then you can say I'm in the kingdom. This I'm governed by what the king wants me to be governed by. Amen? Amen. What a great story. Amen. This is, you know, this is our king <laughs> talking to us. <laughs> this is the same one. There's the story and then there's the real guy that Hallelujah. said this way back then. And then there's the real guy that's in us. Y'all get that? Yes. There's the, the king that's in the story, the parable. But there was the king that said the parable. And then that same king is inside of us. And he's, uh, he's taking account of his servants. 
All right. Um, Verse 32, then his Lord, after that he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt, because thou desirest me. So in truth, he wasn't even trying to pay the king back. I mean, he got off scot-free from all of what he owed the king, and now he's just getting money for himself. It's not even honorable in the sense of trying to pay the king back. I forgave thee all that debt because thou desirest me. Shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant even as I had pity on thee? Okay. So he didn't say, shouldn't you have had compassion on that guy? Did y'all catch the rest of it? As I had pity on thee. That's how you should have done it. As I did to you, you should understand See, it's like the king isn't saying, okay, look, I'm, I'm the king of Christianity. I'm the king of Christianity. And as your king, O oh Christians, you should do the Christian thing also. No, no. His heart's supposed to govern this kingdom. It's not a set of rules. It's not a set of, of figuring out what the, what the order is or what all this is. It's a matter of pressing past the words that seem to spell out the order of the kingdom and find the heart of the king. Then, you'll, then the order and all of that stuff won't be stuck in your mind trying to remember it. Have you ever done that? Have you ever been in a situation you go, oh man, I heard that shared in one of our services. How's that go? Anybody ever done that one? You know, oh God, let's see. Oh man, you know, and then you walk off from the situation and go, ah, it would have been perfect if I just remembered it at that moment how to say that. It's not figuring it all out. It's not really having a grasp of principles. There's first and foremost, if you know his heart and you're one with him, you're one, you're You're a branch, and he's the vine, and he brings forth the stuff. But if you think it's about being a branch that you hang books on, and, you know, and and pictures of Jesus on it, or, you know, all these Christian things, and go, "I'm I'm a branch, look, look. I have the Ten Commandments hanging from me. Anyway, you know, all these, these things, these things, it's overwhelming. It's, all of that is too much. There is, you can't do it all. You say, well, I can too because I'm a good Christian. Okay? Try this. Um, pray without ceasing. Um, Take care of your family. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. You know, I mean, I can keep going, and there's a ton of them. You know, it's like like you're a juggler, and you're pretty good with two of them. You know, one goes up, one's in your hand. I'm really doing it. Okay, let's try three. See, this looks cooler, too, doesn't it? I'm really going good here, going good. And the Lord goes, here, catch, here's another one. You know, uh, uh, here's another one, you know. And then another one, you go, I can't, no, no, you know. Christian jugglers? Sorry, Lindsay, I couldn't resist. Shouldn't thou not also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I, even as I? Forget about even as I did to you, even as I, that you, you're more moved by not the rule that I should have done this, you're moved by 
I want it to be even as him. I want it that way in me. That's what I want in me. Verse 34, And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors <clears throat> until he should pay all that was due unto him. All right. All right. Now, I'm, you all know me, so I, I, I picture weird things. But I'm picturing him being delivered to the tormentors. Okay, so they're, they got him chained up, you know, and one guy's, you know, has a, 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 a torch. He's sticking fire on him, ah, you know, and this other guy's got this sharp needle, and he's, ah, you know, and all this stuff. And they're doing all of this tormenting to him. And he's going, how am I supposed to get the money to pay this back with all this going on? Right? Because I'm going I'm to leave you with the tormentors until you pay it all back. <laughs> See, I told you I have a weird mind. But I mean, I'm looking at this and I'm going, that's not really, the, could you do that? I don't think so. You know, and, and even if he got to go to work, you know, and then oh, they're sticking it, you know, with him at work. And, you know, let's say he's a, he's a buggy driver and, you know, he's, ah! and the horse goes off the track. You know, mm -hmm. your, your concentration isn't on the right thing. But was, would his concentration ever be on the right thing? You understand what I mean? Did he, he, he apparently didn't get it right he didn't get it so what makes you think that he's going to get it when the lord gets angry with him you know especially in the midst of the tormentors <clears throat> well there's a way anyway so verse 35 <clears throat> um so likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. Okay, so this is um, also an issue of forgiveness. Okay. Um, well, I'm the way that I am because of these ten people, how they ruined my life. Or just these two, my parents, or you know what I mean. My dad, just this one, whatever. Um, I've said this so often, I probably haven't said it enough recently, but, you know, I've always said that unforgiveness is a luxury that you cannot afford. And it is a luxury you cannot afford. Because if there's anything that will kill your ministry quicker is the fact that that you get hurt here, and then, then you don't forgive that, and then you move on, and somebody does this, and you, you don't forgive, and you know, because it adds up. And after a while, I promise you, you will be so unforgiving, and, and the, you, you won't even want to be in the ministry anymore because you'll hate everybody, you know, because people, people will do you wrong, people will hurt you, people will, will. Uh, there's all kind of junk that people will do to you. Trust me. And you know, the more the the more you're in ministry, the higher up you are. You know, anybody ever been to a turkey shoot? <laughs> you know, the the more he sticks out his head, the, the better shot you're gonna have. You know what I mean? And so, yeah, there's things that happen. There's things that that, um, that are not fair. And there are things that people should never have done and, and things that weren't true and uh, all this kind of junk. Um, and if you continue to bear those and do not get rid of that stuff by really from your heart forgiving them, not because they, you know, I believe that I've had people come to me and they say, oh, Randy, I did so-and-so, would you forgive me? And I'm, I've had a few come that it wasn't from their heart. You know, it was like, well, just forgive me then. Hmm, I just remembered what I did. Uh, that's funny. 
Um, you, you, you go, well, then I can't forgive you because you haven't really come to me. Either you haven't come to me or when you came to me, you didn't come in the right spirit or, you know, I didn't mean it or this and that. You know, let, let God deal with all those people. You stay with Jesus. I'm, look, I'm staying with Jesus. You know, my heart it would be to, you know, grab you by the throat. Remember, that's what it was talking about. Grab you by the throat and say, look, you need to get this right. And then this will be cleared up. See, same story. Jesus is still talking. Now he's talking about forgiveness. <clears throat> You just have to, you have to go on. You have to be with the Lord. You have to do it through thick and thin. And, it, and trust me, the more that you do that, the more it will be second nature to you. And the more you'll be more clean than, than um, infested. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Infested with this stuff. Just eating you alive, you know. And so, you know, it sounds like such a simple, simple subject, forgiveness, but it is so, so huge. And you really, you really won't be worth anything much down the road, you know. All right, so, shall, so likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not every one. Uh, I remember many years ago that I had, and I'm, I hate telling these stories, but I'm in a flux right now because I've had several more people come to me. So I'm going uh, to tell this one. But I, there was a period that I was going through, and I had a... I'd, I had a lot of um, beasts attacking me at the time. They were, you know, <laughs> taking bites and stuff. And, um, and it was like I was wrestling with it and everything. And then uh, I saw or read it on the Internet or something, saw a sign. And it said, forgive everybody everything. <laughs> and I just went... Well, that actually sounds pretty good. Have y'all heard that sign before? I saw a sign for the eyes. I saw a sign. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the, I mean, I, you know, it just really, I just realized, you know, we, we should forgive everybody everything. We're, but we go around, we go, well, I'll forgive you. I won't forgive you because, da, 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 and I'll forgive you, but. I'm not going to forgive you. Forget. So it just, it just, a bunch of chains fell off of me, and I just went. I'm, I'm going to forgive everybody everything. I don't need to hold all this stuff, you know. Well, somebody said so and so. Oh my God, my life's ruined. Somebody said something bad about me. I remember, I remember when, when. Uh, some of these young ladies first came to New Creation Fellowship, and there was a kind of a backlash from parents or friends of the family or whatever, and uh, and they said uh, that this place was a cult. And um, man, that ate on me. I mean, I know that's the, probably the worst thing you could say to any group about them because that. Just, you know, people will put up with a lot of stuff, but if you're called, oh, no. I'm going, oh, my God, this is the death knell, knell for us. This is, this is horrible. And they're spreading it around, and thank God email had just come out. You know what I mean? I mean, it was going ever. I'm just going, oh, my Lord. You know, and then they put stuff on the web, you know. And, and um and I was, I was really wrestling with it. I was really fighting with it. And then one day the Lord, I guess he got tired of watching me rolling in the dirt. You know, that's kind of what it felt like. <laughs> Writhing. He said, <clears throat> um, Randy, is this a cult? I said, no, that's my point. 
He said, that's my point. <laughs> he said, are you a cult leader? As Lindsay has often said, if I am, I'm the worst cult leader in the world because I control so little <laughs> and demand so little. <laughs> but it, it was like a, a new dawn. I went, oh my God, why was I worrying about that? You know how it is. You can just get all wrapped up in stuff and it's just, it's like a snake wrapping itself all around you, choking you and all this stuff. And you just, you know, at that point I was just able to, Rip that thing off and throw it down and say, you're done, buddy. And go on and be with the Lord. And I haven't looked back since. And stuff still comes up every once in a while. And I don't go, oh, there it is again. You know? I just keep on going for Jesus. I'm just going to, that's what I'm going to do. Because I'm going to have to stand before him. And that's all that counts. I just want him. All right. So... Now that I've spoken all this on this parable, I'm going to read to you all that I had written on this parable. <laughs> so I'll, I'll do it kind of quick here. Uh, one man got forgiven a major debt but went out from the king, met someone who owed him a small amount. He then threatened him to pay, but he could not. Then he had him thrown into prison till he paid all. When the king found out that the man did this to another, after him being delivered by the king's graciousness, he handed him over to the tormentors until he paid all his debt. <clears throat> After telling this parable, <clears throat> then Jesus, um, I hope this isn't the notes that I think it is. <laughs> um, After telling this parable, then Jesus said that his father would do the same if we don't forgive from our hearts. To be like, to be like this evil servant or Ishmael, is not the lamb that, we sh that, uh, that shall be sacrificed, put to death and eaten in order to give life to the many that shall come after him. So that many is a reference to uh, Romans 8, where it says uh, that, he, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And I see that as eating the lamb the way it happened with the father and with the, the, the prodigal who has, is in the process of becoming the firstborn by eating the sacrifice, eating the same thing that the father lives off of and, and bursting into making merry and, you know, after that. <clears throat> um, along this line, maybe we should ask ourselves, why do some of our oppressors seem so vehemently against us at times? Is it because of the Sarah in you that oppresses others? Because this, this is uh, the part I'm trying to get to here next, hopefully next week, is the big part of the result of all of that. Um, <clears throat> is it because of the Sarah in you that, uh, that oppresses others also? Um, if so, then it is you who make Ishmael's to become that way. All right, um, so I have one <clears throat> excerpt. You don't have to turn there, but it's uh, Genesis 17, verse 20 through 21. It says this, And as for Ishmael, I have heard thee, this is in your oppression again, Behold, I have blessed him and will make him fruitful and will multiply him exceedingly. Twelve princes shall he beget, and I will make him a great nation. But my covenant will I establish with Isaac, which Sarah shall bear unto thee at this set time in the next year. So, um, as far as the spirit, um, when we finish the whole stories, I mean, where are we? We're in 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. Woo! Uh, in 22, we find Isaac going with his father when the, when the father said to this father, take now, because the, the father knows what that's like. Take now your son, your only son, your son whom you love, and offer him for a holocaust, a burnt offering unto me. And he says that <clears throat> as one father to another. 
father Abraham. And, and Isaac, is, he's just with his father. And when they're going up there, he says, well, we've got this and that, but where is, where is the lamb? Where is the lamb? <clears throat> well, as far as what Abraham knew at that moment, this is the lamb, right? God didn't change it till he got up on top of the hill and were ready to do it. You're the lamb. And before that happened, before the ram was made known to him, he takes and he binds Isaac up and lays him on the altar. You hear no resistance. You hear Isaac um, in the beautiful words of nothing. He spoke. He opened not his mouth. Most beautiful words ever spoken. He opened not his mouth in that kind of situation, just like Jesus. You see Ishmael and all of the things that he does even to this day, and then you realize that when God said, I'm going to take care of Ishmael in this way and in this way and in this way. I'm going to do it because of Sarah's oppression and because of my promise to, to your mother. But Ishmael is not the firstborn. He's not. No matter how blessed he looks, he's not the firstborn. He's not my son. So um, we'll stop right here. Well, did y'all have fun tonight? The Spirit of God is wanting to breathe into us more and more of the heart of the Father and the heart of the Son the heart of the Father for the Son, and the heart of the Son for the Father, and the heart of the Spirit for the Son. It's, it's beautiful. All right, Father, we ask you to just uh, allow the Spirit of God to take the uh, feeble attempts that I make of trying to glorify him and raise them to a much higher level, raise them much higher in their hearts, Father, do that by your spirit, Lord, and any of my foolishness, Lord, that is not uh, edifying to anyone, remove that from their memory, Father, that Christ may be all and in all and received up in the glory that he should be, should be glorified. And so, Father, I just ask you also to bless the next class as uh, we prepare our hearts for that. And may your spirit again move and move and move and move and always, always challenge, challenge our, where we're at compared to where you're trying to get us. We ask it in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. All right. We'll take a little break.